Welcome everyone to the Sclenier School Board of Education meeting of February 12, 2019. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you all for coming out on this spicy, crazy day. Um, Starting with this meeting and continuing for all the meetings during the school year, we're going to start a new um, thing called Student Staff Showcase. So we've allocated uh, 20 minutes or so at the beginning of each meeting to um, hear a lot of stuff that's going on in the district. So tonight we have our two inaugural groups from Harvest, uh, one from Harvest, and they are going to be presenting on the global connection to young learners. Welcome. So we introduce ourselves first. Um, my name is Paige Johnston. Uh, I teach first grade at Earth Harvest. And I'm Nella Reitinger. I'm Deb Smith. I'm Jody McMaster. And I'm John Frowers. And um, we thought it would be very exciting to share with you some of the things that we're doing with the Compass um, with our youngest learners. And um, this especially is super exciting, you'll see later in the presentation, because this is like a, an attribute of the Compass that has come full circle. We got the idea from going um, from other people in the district, and then it's gone all the way to the kids, and then ends with um, all of us going to a conference. Yeah, so it's pretty exciting. And um, when we, at the beginning of the school year, we get together with um, our cross district grade level and our grade level, and we talk about setting goals and um, what we want to do going forward. And I, the Compass is amazing because it's really given us an opportunity to see the learner profile and understand what our, our high school students are going to end up like at the end of that. So we think it's really important to be using our vocabulary with them. So um, we decided to really focus on global connections this year. And um, so, well, that first, I only get it. Um, so in the fall, um, for our symposium, some of us attended a session that um, Diane, Jenga, and Mary Marshall had a session on, and where they talked about being globally connected in the community and how much like the SLE parents and students really enjoy that. Um, and that kind of gave us the idea to start a postcard project where we could connect globally with our students and our families and learners. So um, we sat down to kind of write a plan together and it was a really great experience because we really dug deep into the compass. So we looked at the language and we looked at those attributes and especially with that um, global connections piece, we looked at, you know, what does that look like and had to kind of adapt it for what does that look like in a first grade classroom? Because of course that's very different in a first grade classroom than it is in a high school classroom. So we drafted a letter um, to our parents where we explained this project, our rationale for why we're doing this, to build awareness um, in our students for different cultures and uh, different places around the world. So we sent a letter and to all of our families and we requested that they reach out to their contacts and have their you know, friends, family, coworkers send us postcards to our classroom with some interesting facts about that place. So what happens next is pretty cool. So um, what we decided, um, we didn't want to spend a lot of money on this, so we thought, well, what do we have in our classrooms already? Well, <clears throat> we had these uh, maps that were um, above our, I don't know, what do you call it? Above oh, our chalkboard, bolt on. So we took them up. Sorry. Still <laughs> there? <laughs> um, and we, we cut them up, and we were able to get uh, volunteers, um, our parent volunteers. Um, to hang them, and um, we were able to hang a Michigan map, a United States map, and a world map. And then, um, as soon as the letters, it was amazing because all these postcard cards started coming in, hundreds of them from all over the place. 
So at individual, as individual teachers, we shared them with our individual classes because there were so many, there's no way we could share every postcard with every class. Um, and so then what we would do is we would um, take pictures on Seesaw, take a picture of the front of the postcard and the back of the postcard, and Seesaw is an app that we use to communicate with parents so they would know who was sending the postcards and they could always you know, thank their family or friends from wherever they um, sent them from. Um, and then we also shared them on Twitter. Uh, and then we um, would go, we would take the students out into the hall and we would show them on the maps. So we would show them on the maps where these states and countries were, because globally connected is a great term. But when you're six, it's really a hard concept to grasp. So I think mean, taking them out there, having them sit, look at the map, kind of pointing out these places, made it a little bit more real, a little, a little bit more relevant to them. So, um, and you can see how many postcards we got, which was incredible. So much we even had to add a fourth United States map because we had so many on our uh, first United States map we had no, we had no more photos. So um, it actually was very extremely successful. So to kind of come full circle, like Jen said, this project really came full circle for us where we started this year with this goal in mind and then we ended up writing a proposal to go to a conference in Florida, the Future of Educational Technology Conference. And we were able to go with a group of teachers from Celine, which was super exciting and awesome. And Mary Lefford connected us with these gentlemen who have an educational technology podcast. Um, so they uh, they had us sit down and they were kind of asking us some questions about what what we're doing in our classrooms. And naturally, this this project that we were working on all year came up. And they had some great ideas for taking this even a step further using something like connected classrooms to maybe Skype and meet with classrooms around the world or around the country um, and have our classes actually take the next step and interact with kids in another classroom in another place in the world. So that is a really exciting thing for us to kind of think about moving forward, um, kind of taking that next step. So really this, this project has came from a small idea, a conversation between the five of us, and it's grown into something really cool that all of our families have gotten involved in, and now it's kind of hopefully reaching um, other people and places in the world. So I think it's our interview here if you want to hear more about that too. Uh, thank you for having us. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. A global, uh, a global view of uh, Selene area schools that did go to the Future of Educational Technology Conference. So. so, and this is just a sample of the folks who were there. So, the first grade team, Mary Ledford, um, our Harvest Media Specialist, Becca Lantis, I knew I, I did not want to get her last name wrong, who is the um, Media Specialist over at Woodland Meadows, Matt Hamilton from Selene High School, Michelle Chekwitz, the principal over at Woodland Meadows, um, Troy Wissink. Robin Schmidt, who's also on his team, and then three of the instructional designers were also a part of the team. I'll let this turn to
on behalf of, of all 15 of us who had the opportunity to go to Orlando and attend this conference, we are eternally grateful. And we hope that we continue to have opportunities like this. If you have any questions for anyone on the team, by all means. I do. I just like so. You know, not having enough. What's the next thing? What's the? I mean, I haven't been to that conference before, so typically, I think that one does kind of look at what's the new trend or something you hadn't seen at a previous conference as it relates to tech. And for me, I um, stepping out of the classroom and into the media position, I'm with the support classroom teacher, so gave me a lot of ideas of how I can support this curriculum, K to three in the library. I'd like to start podcasting with my students. I want book trailers. Um, and so I was able to sit in on a couple of sessions of what it takes to create a really good podcast and how to get that out there. So I have a lot more ideas of what I can do in the library that will support the K-3 teachers. I think too, um, a big <clears throat> thing that I saw was the physical manipulation of coding for really young learners. So um, taking that abstract idea and putting it up almost into what looks like a game or a toy and having kids physically see how their actions affect the code and using that as a building block for the littlest learners on top of Where's VR and artificial intelligence admins probably sick of me asking something quickly? Like, I just see if that's an area that's going to explode shortly. Is that out there yet in, in any media? Yeah, there are many, many okay, different sessions okay. for that. Yeah, every session. Yeah, every session. Every talk. Yeah. 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 I'd be happy to share um, a link to a video mm -hmm. that I created. Um, I worked with the high school and brought the high school over on brain development. So we did a growth mindset unit you know, with the third graders because they were saying, I can't do math or reading is hard. So we wanted to have that growth mindset vocabulary. So the high schoolers in our brains class came over and worked with the third graders and we did virtual reality. So I had them project the brain and all the components and that um, each high schooler was able to share what each part of the brain did and was responsible for. So that the students understood that when your breathing rate goes up, this is the part of the brain that's working. Um, when you say you can't do something, this is the part of the brain that's shutting down and the neurons aren't actually firing. So um, they really understood it through the AR and the VR merge cube that I was able to bring to the table. I just had a comment about the postcards because I remember when when Betty took me around Harvest and I was visiting you all in the classroom, um, that hallway is beautiful. Like you, walk, it's it's visual, and so to, for little six-year-old folks to be able to see that and kind of make those connections and and see all of those postcards in places outside of the United States, I think is is really key. And I loved knowing that you guys got so many postcards that you could put them all up. It was great. I actually brought some. Um, a friend of mine asked for one of the classes and. Uh, you didn't need them anymore because you had so many. So, <laughs> I, I like it. No, yeah. There were a ton. So if you want more, um, but like the, if the participation from the families and and everybody seemed really great, and so it was something that the, the little ones could work on and learn about, and it looks great. Thank you. Thank you. Try to be sure that the next one's in Orlando in January. <laughs> we had a snow day up here, yeah. so <laughs> maybe, yeah, they know choice. what they're doing. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, this is the first opportunity for public comment. If anyone would like to make public comment today. Okay, administration. Uh, just a couple of things. Obviously, it's been a challenging uh, couple of weeks. So do you want to know in terms of the, the ice and snow days, kind of where we're at? Um, currently have, as I think you know, we were given six days, uh, kind of a grace period to, uh, from the state for active guide days because two of the days occurred during state of emergency days. Those will also be waived. We're on day number seven um, now. So if, if we were to not have school tomorrow, we would be kind of exhaustive of our existing days. Um, there are a couple of scenarios. I know the legislature is talking about whether or not they'll do some additional waiving. There are districts much worse off than we are related to that. There is the ability to ask for three additional waived days. I will tell you that um, one of the things with the three additional waived days, um, not wanting to make those up is not the official, what you write in the letter. Um, it talks about it an undue burden. And so it, just because you can ask for a waiver, it's not really about districts that miss a couple extra days getting those waived. It's for districts that maybe miss six over getting a portion of those waived. If you recall during the polar vortex years, that's what happened. We had some days waiving, we also made up some days. So. Um, 
not a slam dunk there. It's kind of unclear as to what will happen. I know districts are talking about uh, uh, making up days within this the existing schedule, which happens a lot in Ohio and Indiana, where there are no uh, waiting days. So um, we're, we're kind of working through that, but I would caution everyone to be flexible as we have about probably a good five and a half weeks of uh, winter weather left. There are a lot of uh, districts going to e-learning days now instead of snow days and making them official uh, things. It, it, you know, it would be interesting to see if the Michigan, you know, because I don't, I think some of the seat time waiver things would need to be adjusted for us to be able to claim, but I know Indiana and Ohio both have those days where they now are, are official through the Department of Education. So, you know, if this, this trend continues, certainly technology is available, um, it's not a perfect solution by any stretch, but it may be part of a solution if we look at these winters that we have such significant disruption. So we think something might come out of Lansing that would give us I, uh, some other some, Yeah, yeah. I, we, my, my sense would be that almost the, the bad spot you'd want to be is at like nine or ten days because there may be a scenario where they essentially try to, to hold harmless the districts or at least you know, help the districts that are way above. Um, what happened with the polar vortex is if you weren't way above, you were kind of just a couple of over, you, had to, you were kind of stuck making up some days. So. Um, but it, it's possible, to, again, depending on the next five weeks, that they're going to make some change. It is a slippery slope if we if we say we're not, we're going to wave days all the time. No pun, literally. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a slippery <laughs> waterwork is what it is. But it's a it be, it, it, it's a challenge in terms of if we say, oh, well, let's just no matter how many days, let's just wave them. What what okay? What's the value of what we're doing? It, again, I would, it would you know, there's a balance there in terms of saying, oh, it doesn't really matter. We can you know not worry about it. Well. Um, it's important and, and uh, time in, in, in front of our staff is important. So back in Canada, we just put on an extra pair of warm socks, yeah, but, yeah, I, but minus I did, 40 is still. Is I did is. note that Windsor was in session when we were not, so I, I didn't. It was not lost on me or my mother, actually. <laughs> <laughs> they are south of Detroit. Right, well, the, I the warm water off the Detroit River probably kept them on. Anyway, board members? Just a couple of things. I did want to com compliment Scott on his uh, taking the good natured ribbing so well. I mean, it's the most <laughs> eagerly anticipated tweet of the week. I mean, there's snow coming. And, and the week before the, um, the polar vortex, he, he wrote some, some snide comment about, oh, dry air coming in, boys and girls. Get lots of rest. I was hopeful. And 164 <laughs> tweets within five minutes came in. And a lot of them very creative, too, i got to say. The one, my favorite, I still have it, is a Caillou slipping in, in Scott's face on top of it. I also uh, wanted to say um, thanks to everybody who participated in the community conversation we had on January 29th. That was my second, and we've had three so far, I think maybe four. Four, four conversations so far. They've been great. And things are starting to happen. And uh, I've been delighted to see that. So. I had a few things. Um, I wanted to thank Brian, first of all, for getting together with me and uh, educating me about the SEA and talking about ninth grade. And in particular, that was great as I get to know uh, more staff in the district. Um, I also got to spend Friday night with about 50 high schoolers, uh, which was fun. Um, starting to go to some high school clubs. We have over 60 clubs at the high school, really impressed with these student leaders. Um, the first one that I ended up picking was strongly influenced by my nine-year-old son. It was the Smash Bros. <laughs> uh, so it's the newest uh, newest club up at the high school. Had about 50 kids at it. It's, it's a really nice cross-section. You have people that can drop in. You have um, all grades, all walks of life at this very inclusive club dropping into play. A very popular game that came out around Christmas. So love that. Um, many of us attended Snow Blast. Um, recently that, that raised over $75,000 for the foundation in our district, which was great. And as a parent, I wanted to thank the administration for getting the calendar for next year out early. Um, many people were very happy with the June 5th date, so thank you for getting that out early. So we can plan. Uh, Governor Whitmer has declared February Career and Tech Education Month in the state of Michigan. So. Um, Oh, and that we have a very successful program up at the high school. There are alternatives, I would say, to college that come out of that program. Um, a lot of skills that you can learn in the tech ed program that also do involve some college, but it's uh, a good program. Uh, we have, when they go to the Skills USA at the end for their competitions, we always have a lot of medal winners. So, something to consider for your students. 
welders skills or I mean they're they're good paying high paying jobs so it's good stuff to learn that's all I have. can I have a motion please to uh, approve the agenda as printed so moved second all those in favor please signify with aye aye, aye. aye. those opposed hearing none the motion carries six zero I neglected to say that uh, Trustee Austin has been plowing and salting and doing whatever since way early this morning, so he needs to get some rest, uh, so he is not here tonight. Um, our first scheduled report is a special education report. Uh, Director Garcia. Hi. Hi, Mal. How are you? I'm actually going to present the report from right here. Um, I'm going to present from right here, and we'll see why. Mm -hmm. and, oh, I was going to say, you're not sitting back there. Right yeah, so we have Monica Ellis, the Assistant Director of Special Education with me tonight. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, so, oh, hey, thanks. Thanks, Troy. Okay, so if you can see, oh, that's it, is it popping up? Okay, well, what I did was make a mess now. Give me one second. This is the global part of the This is the global part of the meeting. <laughs> this is Molly demonstrating her need for continu continuous tech growth. <laughs> so what I tried to, oh, there it is now. You can see at the bottom of the presentation that we are using a Google extension called Remote Slides so that your presentation is closed captioned. So as we get farther in, you'll see that's part of one of the things we're taking on as a department. So real quick, a district overview for you. We currently serve 716 students that have IEPs. That's right around the state average of about 13.5% of our student body. We provide services to students aged 3 to 26. We have full services in every building, as well as peer programming um, ages 3 to 26. This is a disability profile for you. The key pieces to this are that are large pieces of the pie. Uh, otherwise health impairment, speech and language impairment, specific learning disability, and autism spectrum disorder. That's pretty common with state and national trends as far as the largest percentage of our students with IEPs. We have some of our own specific disability trend data. This is also pretty on course with what we see state and locally. The um, purple line here that has a slight uptick is our autism spectrum disorder eligibility category. Our top one here is specific learning disability and this dip that we have right here, there were some changes to the eligibility uh, process and how students could qualify and that'll line up with our slight um, uptick in the speech and language impairment. When we switched how students were eligible, if they didn't um, become eligible under specific learning disability in the area of language comprehension, we ended up being able to find them under speech language disorder. Some of our department updates, we had goals from 2018 of continuing to support the co-teaching at the high school, and we were able to have a team come in this fall and do um, some walk around audits of our current partnerships. That was feedback I had from the staff at the high school, and I asked them what they needed to help move along co-teaching. They asked, we'd just like somebody to come in and watch what we do and help us make decisions based on what we currently do. We really don't want to go to any more training. We want to just to look at our model. Um, expanded social thinking this year to include interested general education partners. Social thinking is a methodology that helps students think about thoughts and feelings, and it can support communication and behavior needs. And this has been a pretty big success, not only for our department, but I'd say for all of the um, staff in general who really see a need for our students as far as being able to positively communicate. And then continued professional development to support staff in the evolution of our inclusion model. We take pretty seriously that inclusion isn't just a location, it's access to all of the amazing things we do here in Saline. Uh, a couple things I didn't touch on is that we were able to actually run a, a micro-credentialing course on social thinking, and there were quite a few general education staff who also participated in that. And we have added some of our special education staff to our literacy team, so they're also helping support professional development for everybody as well. Department updates continued. We were able to add an assistant director position to the department to help 
with leadership as far as it relates to our post-secondary transition programs. So I'll let Monica talk a little bit about the ways we've been able to expand MRS and some of our parent involvement pieces. So that was one of the charges that Molly gave me was to expand our program with MRS. And for those of you that may not know what MRS is, it's a state agency that um, provides rehabilitation support and vocational training. And there's quite a bit of money right now for pre-employment services, so that's what we're really tapping into. Um, we have approximately 40 students at the high school right now that um, take part in a pre-employment readiness class one time a week. We also have students that are in the adult program doing this and our alternative education program. Um, the other thing that we look to do is provide more parent resources for them. Uh, so we've brought in MRS to do evening presentations for our uh, uh, parents and our staff if they would like to attend. Um, we've also hosted through our SEAC committee, our special education committee, um, uh, 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 a resource for them. Uh, we did a guardianship training as well as um, information about um, social security. And then we have one coming up in um, April for community mental health support. So we're really trying to make those connections for parents and bring those resources to them because there's lots of decisions for our, our families with um, disabilities. And a lot of the parent presentation topics came right out of parent surveys on what they felt they needed more information on. We've also been able to partner with Gym America and Can't Zip to run some pretty exceptional recreational and leisure activities. We have cardio drumming at the high school and we have our EC, one of our ECSE classrooms and one of our high school classrooms that's going to Gym America one time a week for some adaptive gymnastics. And we have also uh, really supported um, or collaborated with the tech department. So Robin um, Schmidt and Troy with the accessibility, the digital accessibility. They've done a nice job updating our district website, but really working on getting tools into the hand of our teachers so they can support their general education counterparts with the AMMR stands for Accessible Materials Made Right. So creating their tests and their documents that can be easily scanned and read in. We've gotten a grant from the foundation for Capti Voice, which has um, numerous capabilities, but it's reading tests, it's digital libraries, and there's also some translation um, capabilities in there. So we're pretty excited about a lot of this. We also just have a couple photos here highlighting. This is our Firebird business. That's our life skills classrooms in grade six through young adult. They make and sell fire bricks. We have our young adult here live in large on some of our new furniture. This is Heather Malash's algebra class putting um, fractions into use making, I believe, pancakes that day. Social thinking, again, just a couple different samples here. We have kind of the idea of going with the group plan, not always doing your individual plan, and then they have some very concrete ways for students to think about their own thoughts and feelings, and that's the super flex curriculum with the unthinkable. There's a rock brain in there. Kids are very, very, not only staff, but kids are very, very responsive to that methodology. Student choice and voice are connecting class and our club at the high school have done some amazing things. They run uh, once a month weekend events that are a social activity for our students as well as our shopping trip, our holiday shopping trip that I think some of you were able to come and visit. Some samples of our Gym America. And then just our future, future goals to continue support building Level teams with the Compass Connections, uh, resource allocation, planning, professional development, continue to support the evolution of um, social thinking, both horizontally and vertically, and really continue to develop and expand post-secondary opportunities for our students. And this is not only here in Selene, but really collaborating with the ISD on figuring out how we can make um, post-secondary outcomes better for our students. That is it. All right, any questions from the no, I have an easy question. Oh, sure, go ahead. Um, you mentioned serving 716 students, and I was wondering if that includes students that get home services. You mean like they may participate in homebound? It, it, so that 716 is anybody with an IEP. That's that's a registered Saline area school student, but does or does oh. not include students that might um, receive services that aren't a part of the district? Okay, so that does not include our non-public service plans. Okay. Yes, yeah, so anybody who's with Washtenaw Christian or that you're talking about a home school plan, yep. no, those are counted differently. I can put those numbers in next year if you'd like to see that information. I was just curious. What no, so that's means. in addition to, off the top of my head, I think we have roughly about 30 to 40 of those that we, we service. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
have a question? Sure. Um, so uh, in Wayne County, I was able to meet with um, someone, I think he represented the county um, for the Michigan Rehab Services. Um, so I'm glad to you know find out that we um, mm -hmm. are working on that. So is that something um, that each school district is doing? Um, is it uh, Washington Intermediate School District? Do you, do you have any, I guess, um, connections, working relationships with people across Washtenaw? We, um, yes, they do work with all schools in Washtenaw County. Um, and then we have a transition meeting that we meet as a um, county at the ISD to, you know, make sure that those supports are connected and that we're using resources um, in ways to give students a lot of options and choices. Great. In my experience, Washington is one of the more progressive MRS pockets they're mm -hmm. very very involved and they have um so we have a cash match agreement with them which allows us to do a lot of the extended pre-employment stuff that doesn't always happen in every county so okay. they do a really good job serving our yeah students. this person did more um i guess working with um community organizations as well that do like the career prep and stuff so. yeah okay Thank you. and the young adult program talent show is march 1st yes be bold and be heard very excited it's the middle first yes thank you oh, for polar plunge march february 22nd. march 1st yep and polar plunge is february 22nd we have yet to have a board member jump so uh oh gosh <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah you said that about wasn't the that some... yeah yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> so just, or you can donate or you can donate <laughs> Our second schedule, the scheduled report is the idea swarm. This is the principal's stager and you go. Thank you for having us present tonight. So this past summer, Teresa and I uh, went to Minnesota for this Innovate K-12 Summit. And Innovate K-12 is something that was started by Minnetonka Public Schools about maybe eight-ish years ago. And really what it is is a platform to collect ideas and to promote this, uh, this idea of getting staff to submit their ideas at the district level. And so we came back from that summit and this year is really about piloting in the K-12 at Selene Area Schools. So the ideas that we're looking for are things that can better improve the building, the district, the things that everybody talks about but doesn't really know how to get it started. So this is a way, as Alex mentioned, to collect all of those, but to do it in, in really a non-threatening way. Uh, it's an online form, online format, and then there's voting that comes, and we'll talk about that a little bit. But we had originally planned when we spoke with Steve and Scott uh, before we left that we would do the pilots at the high school and Heritage because it made the most sense given that the two of us were in those buildings. But when we got to Minnesota, they had a lot of, they had mentioned that many of their ideas came through food service, grounds and transportation, the K-12 departments. So we decided to add those in as well. So those are also a part of this year's pilot. So the time frames of... We're not. We'll get there. Find out the computer. There, there we go. So the time frames, just so you've got an idea, what we've got uh, moving on. One more time. We're good. We're Thank you. We're good. Uh, so it's a, it's really a big project, and a lot of the districts that do it district wide, it's a big hoopla. I mean, it's a, it's a lot. They do all this, all these uh, tweeting hints out, and we try to do a little bit of that, but on a smaller scale because we're only doing it in the two buildings. So January 28th, we kicked it off, which was a snow day, I believe. <laughs> and we've had, you know, seven in between. <laughs> so March 1st uh, is when the idea submission will close. And then we've got some time between March 1st and March 11th as a team to go through the ideas that have gone, that have been submitted, and really uh, connect any that some of them may have been similar. Um, and, and do any really tweaking that we need to because starting March 11th, it's called pairwise voting. And what happens is the system that's created puts 
matches up these different ideas against each other randomly. And the, people's, uh, the people who have submitted it, their names are not a part of it, it's just the idea itself, you can go through and look. But what happens is everyone who logs in to vote has a different set of them that they're voting on. And so at some point, ideas start floating to the top as the ones that the most groups have, um, have approved or have thought were good ideas. Now, we have a little bit of a, um, of a thing in here because some of them are high school ideas, some are elementary ideas, some are K-12 ideas that we will go through after the voting and pull those apart. Who gets to vote? I'm sorry. Anybody can vote. Anybody. You can vote, Paul. I will vote. You want to vote? <laughs> you can submit ideas oh, too. I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so, um, as Teresa said, so there's a website, uh, Statfield, a login basically is their email they create an account. And this is what that site looks like. So, staff members have been visiting this, and then they simply click submit an idea. Take you to what the form looks like. So, on the form, um, there are some different fields to, to complete. You know, one is the title. Um, we select which group the idea really fits for. So is it an idea that's just for heritage? Is it just for high school? Or is it an idea that might span multiple buildings, which would be really more of a district level idea? And then the idea size, um, small, medium, and big. When we went to the training this summer, they really do that by cost or estimated cost. And so small is a really low cost idea. So anywhere between zero and about $500 is what we've arbitrarily set. Medium is about 500 to about 2,000. And then big would be 2,000 and up. That's just what we're going with for this year. So I can imagine what your ideas are probably, or what your question is, is where's this money coming from? <laughs> because we're, we're deciding on all this. We're gonna go ahead and let people submit ideas and we're gonna take money and, and figure it out. So the, the great thing about this type of process is that you can utilize funding sources from different places. So some of these may be something that um, at some point, and Alice will talk about this a little bit later, um, that the FSA asked, maybe it's a grant that wasn't through the foundation, but um, through PTOs and PTAs, through building funds, through district money, this is where that allocation would come from. It's, it can really come from anywhere that, that there is a money pot. And some may not cost anything. That's a big part of it too. Some of them, and a few of them that we've had submitted, aren't any cost at all. Yeah, I think about half the ideas that have been submitted so far are considered small ideas just because they may be no cost, but that doesn't mean they're not important or won't have a huge impact for us. So currently this is what it looks like. We've had 14 ideas that are currently district and then two at the high school, two at the heritage levels. Um, Teresa and I and the instructional designers actually met and seeded some ideas into the system. That way when staff first log in, they see some ideas that are already existing. Um, but nonetheless, this is where we're at right now. And about yeah, a little under 20 days to go before we close the idea submission phase. So as we mentioned, the pairwise voting, um, you're presented with two ideas side by side, and then there's a question, and all you have to do is you, you take a look at the question and decide which of these ideas better answers it. And then the system starts putting them together behind the scenes so that we can take a look at which ones rise to the top. It's a, it's a pretty neat idea. And from, from what I understand, this, the groups that have done it really like this process because it, it is very, um, it's, it's, it can be, um, <laughs> anonymous, sorry, <laughs> with the word escape me. It can be anonymous, so you don't have to worry about names being attached to it, which is helpful. And then again, they're randomly paired. Um, you can vote as often as you want. You'll get different ideas at different times, ranked up against each other. And after this is done, we'll go through and we'll pull the ones that rose to the top in the different areas, because there will be some high school ideas that may didn't, maybe didn't make it all the way to the top or some really good um, K-12 ideas that we might wanna pull. And the cool thing about this too is as you're going through the ideas, there are some that we might just pull and do. They don't have to go through the voting process. There might be some that you look at and you go, oh, this is a really good idea. This doesn't cost any money. It's really not gonna take up a lot of planning. Let's do that. So, after the pairwise voting process, those top vote getters, those ideas that um, have the most support behind them, really go through this human-centered design process. Um, so it's kind of like a, a workshop, if you will, um, where we 
work with kind of that idea champion or whoever wants to take that idea forward. And we really kind of dive into what's the problem that we're trying to really solve here? How does that idea solve that problem? Um, and then kind of go through this prototyping, if you will. So uh, this is the process we'll go through after we get those taco pairs. Just to kind of mention this, um, the communication and marketing piece is really important. Um, we learned that this summer, and so Anna Brunel's really been helpful. So we have a, a, a Twitter feed, if you will, the Slim Idea Swarm. I encourage you to follow that. Um, and we have some pretty interesting and fun tweets that are coming out from that. Um, really just trying to build some momentum. So you'll see some memes, uh, which uh, other districts have done as well. And so um, this is great because it's fun, it's exciting. Um, and this one about celebrating is important because we want to celebrate all those staff who submit an idea or comment on ideas um, or participate in voting in some way. So this is just one way of doing it. I walked into a classroom before before we had launched the idea swarm, but we were just sending out like the phishing tweets. And uh, I walked into Corbin Brown's physics classroom before school. And he said, "Okay, you got me." I said, "What are you talking about?" He said, "I'm in. I'm hooked. You got to tell me what it is." I said, "Well, six more days, and you'll know." He's like, "You're seriously not going to tell me?" I said, "I can't. I'm sorry. I can't." So when we think about this idea swarm pilot, we really think three things. One, it's about encouraging all staff to submit or share their ideas. It's also about being able to see ideas district-wide. It's kind of cool that high school teachers can see what heritage teachers have, are submitting. Um, and then the last piece is, you know, linking this to funding sources potentially, like the foundation, um, or PTO, PTAs, that kind of thing. That's all we have for you. What questions do you have for us? I'm just wondering, is will do you anticipate this helping with the foundation? They're always trying to do building grants and stuff like that, and it's like, oh, it's so much work trying to figure these out. Is Do you think this is gonna help identify some of that a lot easier? To I mean, I definitely see the potential for this to kind of establish that stream of ideas that come in, and also with that, the human centered design process, like vetting those and developing those ideas, right, before bringing them to the foundation as well. And so then those that are um, connected to the compass, I could see fitting really well with the foundation process. We did share this presentation, not this presentation, an earlier version of it, uh, before the launch to the foundation. And we met with Sean Skelly uh, a few times and had the conversation that this might be something that would be helpful to them, this, this actual program. Yeah for helping vetting ideas too. So it's it's still in the early stages, but it's it's definitely a connection yeah, we, with me. Yeah, they've been involved the conversation in the process. And they've been involved in the process as well. Yeah. So yeah. John and, and Don Day is a part of it as well from the foundation. So I like your name. At at work we call it wild ass ideas. Oh, but we all <laughs> sit together. So <laughs> yeah. I, your name's a little more real. Yeah, yeah, the media form is already better. I think creating the name that was the hardest thing it for was. us. I'm gonna be honest like it was ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was a little obvious. Yeah, I think from a standpoint of it, this is somewhat of a corporate idea, and I know it came, there's United Health, I think, was the organization that kind of first yeah. got it to uh, Minnetonka, but this idea of corporate, and this idea that a lot of great ideas never make it to administration or others within the organizations, and so uh, this is an opportunity for us to, over time, I think, create a system to where we can gather the, the ideas that are out there and can really best uh, make some improvements. You know, like the folks who know what's going on in the buildings are closest to the action. If we can gather their ideas and have a process to refine them, I think we'd be in great shape in terms of trying to innovate and improve. And I think it also engages all staff in that process too, right? In one you know, form or another. Well, to me, it captures, it, it encourages people to really speak out when they see something that could be improved and look for those opportunities for improvement, which you know, sometimes you're just head down doing what you're doing, you, you forget to look at what if um, and how it can improve. And some of these are ideas, you know, things that we've, problems that we've been looking for solutions for, right? Issues that, that you know, anything can help. So it's, the one, and the ones that are in there, the ones that came in after we seeded them are, are exciting, it's, it's neat, it'll be fun. I had something to kind of to layer on Heidi's idea. I, I, I wonder if you have any staff that are collaborating with students for ideas because I know just in, in the kids that I know have, they have a ton of ideas on how to improve things, particularly their playgrounds if you ask the <laughs> elementary kids. We, we did have the conversation about whether or not to include students um, and 
in the future we feel like that's the way to go but given that this was a pilot uh, we didn't we didn't know how it was going to take off and what it was going to look like and we didn't want it to be because the students do have great ideas they come and let us know all the time we didn't want it to be overwhelming mm -hmm. for us yeah. so we thought this was the the better way to go for this year but that is looking forward something yeah or to or to have a collaboration yeah. opportunity with a staff member so it's not just free reign so every student can because you'll have a lot more than 14 yeah. district wide um yeah. but it could be a collaboration point yeah i would agree yeah, and then some some information we share um we encourage staff to reach out to students right to get their feedback as part of this process it's just staff that are submitting the ideas Thanks. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you. Action items. Can I have a motion to adopt the 2018-2019 budget amendment as submitted by Assistant Superintendent Housley? So moved. Okay. So first, thank you for being here again in the lovely weather and for such an exciting presentation which is our general budget amendment. Um, some of the things we have here, it's kind of a unique presentation for myself as uh, many of the changes that go into this budget amendment actually happened prior to me being here. Janice had done a lot of work in updating this budget throughout the summer and the fall as things were written into actuals instead of estimates. Um, so it wasn't until really the first of the year that I was able to dive deep into some of these um, line items and really kind of looked at it um, with the lens of the new contract that the, was just passed and so I got into some of those salary um, models. So first up on the revenue side, we have the student count and state categoricals. So basically these, um, our student count fall of last year was 5,271.34 FTE, and the fall this year was 5,285.1 FTE. So basically we increased 13.76 FTE, which we already had budgeted in our original um, budget that we were going to increase by 10. So it's just a slightly over what we already had budgeted for. Um, and those numbers do include our students going to WIAC program, the Washtenaw Options Consortium projects. And basically we take that money in because their home base is here, but we turn around and pay that out of expenses to those programs that they're um, running. And then as well, the state categoricals, and basically we kind of true up all the estimates um, for that state aid that we get each month, so it's updated for our January numbers. We haven't yet received February. And some of those examples are our ministers 147 alphabet soup. We have a one, a two, C, D, E, you follow me, the ORS and um, changes. Um, also at risk funding was updated, early literacy targeted instruction. There's a couple of different things that they um, fund throughout the state. And next on there is the land sale. Though the land sale is set for 850,000, we have only recognized in our general fund $808,882 um, due to the land being originally bought with bond proceeds. And thus we had to go through a detailed um, analysis process that um, let us know how much that we needed to return back to the original intent of that bond. So we're not able to recognize that um, in, the entire, in our general fund. So we remain optimistic that that should still close by the end of June. However, if it doesn't, we still have time in our June amendment to move that into our original budget for next year, if that is the case. Then down to our Act 18 reimbursements. This is our special ed funding that funnels through our county taxes and then funnels through the IC to us. And with that, is a whole calculation to where it uh, divvies up the money throughout the county and it based, based on our two year um, two years ago actual so in that essence two years ago we started increasing some of our funding our programming in our special department so we're kind of starting to see those increases on the revenue side um, kind of catch up with that 
and in our federal grant final allocation, so same thing, just kind of truing up for what we actually are starting to receive, and those were, the total for those were just under 77,000, and with that, remember all of those come in with um, offsetting the expenditures, so those always balance out for those um, grants. Some of the examples are Title One, Two, and Three, and also some um, federal spe special ed dollars. Our expenditure side, just kind of wanted to point out some of the different um, things. Obviously, we start our original budget in the springtime, so there's a lot of things unknown throughout the summer and the fall that happen to our staffing, so we're basically turning up for actuals that is happening. Um, for example, we had a whole additional Young Fives classroom, um, and then we also know a lot of the different class structures that um, teachers who paid overages and things like that for throughout the year. And then as well as the recent teacher um, contract, that middle of the big year settlement, we did it all added into the budget revenue. Retirement costs um, increased and we trued up our, our calculations on all of those um, complexities. The benefits and utilities costs kind of continued to creep up a little bit and we kind of monitor those throughout the year to kind of gauge on where we think we'll end up throughout the year. We also are moving to a fixed rate in natural gas, so that should help stabilize that budget a little bit and so that we'll have some stability for about three years. Then into our materials costs, basically we take in um, donations throughout the year, so naturally our um, expenditures on those sites that have to increase with, um, with that. So then the last thing we have on here is just our actual beginning fund balance. So at the end of the year, when we have to put out the budget amendment in June, we actually don't know the exact final numbers through our auditing process. There's always minor adjustments that happen. And so that number ended up uh, slightly lower than we projected. So that came in at 2,898,369. So this next slide basically has those netted up to the total changes that happen. So you know it's on the top, we have the revenues changing uh, 2.2 million, expenditures also increasing about 1.9 million. And not to confuse you that it's at the bottom, but this is actually the beginning fund balance that I said changed um, about 53,000 um, at the beginning of the year. Basically just changing a little bit, adjusting we had to do through auditing processes. So this kind of gives you the 10 foot view of the beginning of the year. Now that we have the set actual that started July 1st, um, revenue and expenditures are going to have the surplus and then getting <coughs> into our fund balance for the end of the year. So overall though, we see those um, uh, increases um, in revenues over expenditures. We really um, remain focused through the end of the year as we want to reduce expenditures and really live within our regular recurring uh, revenues and basically just want to keep that healthy fund balance um, in mind. With schools having such unique cash flow timing, it's very important to keeping our programs and our the success in our district and having the, that base over there for us. So are there any questions? Could you, could you go back a slide please? Yes. So fund balance then you'd say is 6.39%? Correct, in the treasury's form of restricted revenues. Right. Unrestricted revenues, so it's taking out the restricted revenues. So it's not a straight fund balance. Okay. It's good to see it creeping up, um, but we're still in the low, lower than many school districts and um, we'd love to see that move higher yes we need to continue to get that a little bit higher so it protects ourselves for unknowns that will happen <laughs> i can go back to my notes from last year and look at you know, historically but what has it been like 5.1 to 5.5 and if we could see that at some point that would be nice uh, just to just a sense of growth. Absolutely. It's 5. 5. 5. I don't think we have it. Oh, here. Yeah. It's in the patio. 5.87. Yeah. 5. Uh, yeah. One of the things I want to point out on that to fellow board members, um, you see we have a budget surplus there of 
$664,000. That includes the booking the land sale of about $810,000. That's not gonna happen every year. We're not going to be able to sell land every year. That's really a non-recurring item. If without booking that, it's in very often what you would do in, in other accounting presentations is you take that out and call it a non-recurring item, have it at a below line item. If we had that out, we're in a deficit position by about 145,000. So I just want to make sure we, we all understand we are really from an operating point of view operating in a deficit for this year of 145,000. Now we have some time to get that correct, but it shows you how thin we are with that. And if we look at, we operated at a deficit last year, if we do come in at a deficit for this year at 145,000 from an operating point of view together with the deficit last year, that's a $550,000 deficit over a two year period. We don't have any, we can't keep going like that. We don't have a lot of room in this budget. Clearly don't have room to add. We've got to be looking at how do we subtract. So that's just what we have. Great job, Mark. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All those in favor, please signify with aye. 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 Those opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries 6-0. Got a motion to approve the bid recommendations for the middle school science room renovations and the high school track and tennis court projects in the amount of $1,648,295.89 as submitted by Superintendent Graydon. So moved. Second. All right, um, Matt from Clark is here if we have any specific questions, but um, as I noted in, in the memo, um, as we continue to kind of follow through. We had a couple of kind of catch up bids related to um, masonry and structural steel for the middle school uh, science room renovations. Um, we did do our high school track and tennis uh, projects. Um, I will say best asphalt um, is our recommended with for the, it would get the largest portion um, doing the asphalt for both the track and the um, tennis area. Um, it also positions them to, I think, uh, make a make a solid proposal for the west parking lot, so they can do all of those. I think that uh, plays well, hopefully, for us in terms of getting a, a good price on that uh, moving forward. Um, again, reputable uh, contractors. There were there were um, at least one. I think there's just one low bid that was uh, deemed to be unqualified, um, and actually they actually indicated they had missed some items um, in electrical, and so we are with O'Donnell again, O'Donnell is someone we've worked with in the past, and has already gotten some other work, I think, with us this year. So, um, West parking lots are, are coming together, but um, any questions specific to the uh, bids that are on for recommendation today? The, the bids are all predicated that we end school on the Day we're yeah, yeah, correct. A couple, so. yeah, a couple of aspects uh, related to that. One is from a from a middle school science standpoint. Yes, I mean that is a really tight timeline. Um, from a track and tennis perspective, um, given the curing that needs to take place with uh, with both, particularly with the track, like there's a curing of the asphalt, and then the type of surface that we um, specified. Um, is one that also needs to cure and so it's likely frankly right that we'll have to be do, do some displacement right at the end of the year there may be construction of vehicles on site um, during our graduation ceremony it would be obviously behind the stands but um, in order for us to make sure we can get complete that in the summer given again not necessarily the actual work but the curing necessary and the timelines necessary for that um, it will be a very very busy summer so what do we need counter additional charges I mean these are fixed price bids correct if the if we're not able to give them the time that they need to if for some reason we were to to go late yeah we could we could incur a different additional cost if we're driving the the issue with the schedule so science will be outdoors if we're well you know, <laughs> we, 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 we talk, yeah, we, yeah I mean, you know they've actually talked about coming in and the electrical folks doing some prep work over spring break right. to be able to just pull some different things. Um, if you recall with the middle school science rooms, there's an abatement period where we're pulling out some of the old mastic tile and such. And so there's actually a, that, that literally that weekend um, after we get out of school um, is one where we, if we lose even Saturday and Sunday that first week really does put us in a, in a pickle. So um, it's going to be a busy, busy summer in, in maybe not across the district, but in the, particularly the, basically the west side of the high school and in that middle school. To stay 
No worse, no dates. So. Yeah. I, I don't have a problem with this degree. We're not going to call it. Any other questions? Well, hopefully, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries 6 0. Can I have a motion to authorize Scott A. Graydon, superintendent, as the primary signer on all checks written by the district with Miranda Owsley, assistant superintendent of finance, as alternative on all accounts listed? Bank of Ann Arbor, the bond checking account fund, Comerica, Catherine Steiner Burr Scholarship, Michigan Liquid Asset Fund, bond investment account, Old National Bank, General Fund, General Fund payroll checking. Community education checking, food service checking, student activity checking, student activity, the edge, flex benefits, maestro, 2002 debt service, 2016 BNS debt service, 2016 debt service, recreation fund, sinking fund, sinking fund 2018, the Paul Handy scholarship fund, the Tim Corrali memorial fund, the Horton cultural award, the Jeremy Tarlia Scholarship Fund, the Randy Hoffman Fund, the Rachel Townsend Fund, the Dora Mae Meyer Memorial Scholarship, U.S. Bank, 2012 Refunding Bond Issue Debt Service Payment Account, the 2000 Refunding Bond Issue Debt Service Payment Account, uh, one was 2012, the other's County 2012. And we are doing all this because of our change in Janice to Moran. So moved. Support. All those in favor? Any discussion? No? I guess I discussed it a little bit. Uh, all those in favor, please signify with aye. 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 Those opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries 6 0. Can I have a recommend a motion to authorize Scotty Graydon, Superintendent, and Miranda Owsley, Assistant Superintendent of Finance, as signatories on transfers of investment monies? So moved. Support. Again, uh, just an allocation. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries 6-0. Can I have a recommended motion to approve the recommendation of the board to vote for Guillermo Lopez to represent Region 7 on the MASB Board of Directors? So moved. Any discussion? I know we all have read our okay. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries 6 0. Can I recommend a motion to approve the recommendation of the board to vote for Steve Heyer to represent Group B on the MASB Board of Directors? Support. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries 6 0. Got a motion to approve the 2019-2020 School of Choice recommendation as submitted by Superintendent Gray. So moved. Okay. Um, just a quick note, um, that recommendation, we continue to wind it down. We continue to kind of back off on our overall allocation uh, for the second year in a row we're recommending um, that we take 42 slots as a minimum, 25 of which are in the kindergarten level. Um, we continue to provide some flexibility by listing at least one student per grade, again, considering a family that may move adjacent to the district and, and want to be, um, have the opportunity to potentially apply through School of Choice. Um, as you, uh, Miranda noted with our FTE in the fall, we grew slightly, if you consider we added a section of young fives and we, we netted 13 students really were continuing essentially to, to run flat. We continue to be um, in that 5,300 student range. Um, mind you, in 2006, 2005, 2006, we had 5,500 resident students. So uh, school of choice has been something that has prevented us from really, I think, facing um, some significant challenges as it relates particularly to our footprint, uh, among other things. And so our intention is to use this process to, uh, to kind of balance our enrollment. Um, for that. There. Are any questions? Are, are we anticipating more neighborhoods, more students, yeah. growth? What 
want to share some of that? Yeah, you know, in, I would say in general, we are anticipating it. I will tell you, it's not really come to, to fruition. Even if you, you know, look at our, our um, fall to spring, we've got a lot of houses that have been completed and families that have moved in and we continue to kind of run um, at, at roughly the same level. So um, I, I don't know that we're going to grow significantly, even given the residential growth. And many of you are probably tired of hearing the story. In 2005 6, we had 5,500 students, and I estimate between 850 and 1,000 less homes. We now have uh, you know, essentially 5,300 students, you know, several hundred of which are school of choice or non resident. And so we, we just, as a community, even though our rooftops continue to increase, the number of school aged children in our community do not. And so um, it's just a function of our demographic in many ways. And so I think we've been pretty, uh, pretty um, strategic in how we use school of choice. I am being very upfront with families. We, this is the time of year where we start to get a lot of inquiries about school of choice. Um, that if, uh, if there's someone, particularly with, with students at a variety of grades, they're going to be challenged to um, be able to kind of transition into using school of choice. Um, we continue to see families that begin as school of choice families become residents, which I think is another positive. Um, once they kind of establish themselves in the same community, it becomes logistically and, and affinity wise a lot easier for them to just move to the community to the extent that the housing market allows it. So, so our model is to front end low. Yep. PK five to carry them all the way to high school, so we're flatlining that. Yep. Yeah, I can. We continue to see our largest classes at our high school, so to the extent we can build that kindergarten class. So. Um, I have a comment about the um, document for eligibility. Yep. Um, so under non-discrimination, because um, this is dated for 2019, 2020. Um, it is not our current non-discrimination policy that's consistent with um, the state policy or our policies through um, Neola. Neola, thank you. So it's not inclusive of um, gender, sexuality, sexual orientation. We certainly, yeah, we certainly can add it. This one actually is a little bit different because we do talk about academic, artistic, athletic, et cetera. The state gives us some feedback on uh, making sure. It's important for, I think we're gonna add, we can add the other terms, which I think it's appropriate because those are now on our website and are consistent with our values as a community and our values as a school district. This one is even more broad because a lot of times we'll have people ask, well, do, if I have a disability, am I still eligible? Or my son or daughter is in, in band orchestra, or my son or daughter participates athletically, do I get any type of treatment? It truly is a, Know, essentially a blind lottery system but it's important that we add those terms in so people know uh, what we stand for as a community all those in favor please signify with an aye aye, aye. 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 those opposed hearing none the motion carries six uh, discussion items diversity equity and inclusion committee um and grade will kind of yeah, yeah, I just want to give a little bit of background information. Um, we've had four um, community conversation meetings that really have focused on issues of diversity, equity, inclusion within our community. Um, I think each of them were powerful in their own right. If you were at the last one, you know that it, um, it kind of went to it. another level relative to some students who uh, were actually technically former students, alumni who came, recent grads who came and kind of shared their story. And while they shared stories of, of their um, the strength with which the curriculum, the, the strong uh, academic skills that they were prepared for, prepared for as they moved forward, they also shared uh, stories of concern of insensitivities and other um, aspects of our community and our school district that we certainly can improve on. Um, and so that kind of culminated what I felt was a, an extended period of time where we had a lot of conversation. And now we're looking at you know, what type of structural uh, things we put in place to, uh, to better move forward. I think it's an opportunity for us to continue to examine our, our current behaviors, our habits, our language, um, and, and, and our really commits our commitment to improvement in these areas. Um, it continues to be something we want to focus on and improve on. Um, some of the themes that did come out, cultural responsive uh, instruction, we had some training today uh, at, as an administrative group uh, around that area, trying to learn a little bit more what are some first steps we can take as an administrative team and as an organization as it relates to that. Um, another issue in terms of just policy and our practices around those policies um, came out in talking about that. Um, and then kind of this acknowledgement of diversity. How do we acknowledge the diversity within our community and celebrate um, the fact that we are a welcoming community? And, and I think getting better at all of those things will be the, uh, the goal. I know there's some other kind of really fundamental and structural aspects of how we start this community that um, are important for us to consider um, so that we can get the work done. 
frankly. I do want to acknowledge there's several people in the crowd that have been participating actively in Andre. I don't know if Shan is here and, and some others who really have been participating and sharing, you know, thoughtfully their ideas and, and kind of a, kind of concepts around how we can do this in a way. The one thing that continues to come out is that we want to make sure whatever we do um, is something that is long lasting and becomes fundamental to our, our organization. It doesn't become hey, we're going to put a bandage, we're going to you know we're going to check the box. Um, we are action oriented as an organization. The downside sometimes of being action oriented is that we may rush in uh, to, to take kind of actions and check boxes and keep moving fast. Um, this is something that is certainly both taking action and a long game. Of So um, this will become an official uh, committee of the board. We'll add it to our committee list. So um, our next steps will be uh, an application process for the community to apply to be on the committee. Those should be available. Yeah, tomorrow. I would, yeah, we've got a, a application, an online application. If anyone needs it in a different format, we'll be able to certainly get that to them. Our anticipation would be we'd have that open through the Friday the 22nd. And then uh, move forward. It, I mean, there's been a lot of interest in the, in the committee, and so um, it's important for us to, to make sure that we have a committee that's workable. And then to also think about what are the other um, opportunities for participation that we're going to develop. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have a, a number in mind for community members that you would like on the committee? Our number we were talking about was 15, because that, that small group needs to be action oriented. And I was just going to say, but in terms of, you know, it needs to be functioning in a sense. We had a, a committee several years ago, and, and Paul and I were talking about it. It, it was too big, and, and we really got in a spot where we weren't able to, to get actual work done. I think the, the scenario of having a small group that works on it and then has opportunities for feedback on those ideas and thoughts and processes, because then there, there, there are certain, I, I would know less than 30 or 40 people have indicated their interest in being a part, but we know from a function standpoint, we don't, that wouldn't be real. And, and a cross section of um, buildings, right? Okay. Yeah. yeah. So okay. initially, like Superintendent Graydon said, we're looking at 15, maybe 20 people to be what I call the core committee. Um, they need to goals, objectives, definitions, and once that's set, and what, whatever those goals and objectives are, then we'll bring in other community members to help with those goals and objectives. So, and they will um, be reporting back uh, monthly. So, from the board, Trustee Estep, Secretary McVeigh, and myself will be the um, board um, representatives um, for the get-go. So once the application period a week or so is over. We'll make the selections, um, notify everyone, and then get um, get busy with that. Yeah, it's, it should be, well, so this will be a working committee. So the the, the individuals that will be a part of that, um, there will be you know a relatively robust uh, meeting schedule. Uh, initially, and there will be some very specific outcomes that we're going to want to do. I think it's important um, because we've had these conversations ongoing that um, that people in our community start to see some of the fruits of these conversations. I think we, we've listened and, and we've learned, but now let's, let's start to put some things in place, so. Yes, so you said the 22nd, or February 22nd? February 22nd, yeah, a week from Friday would be the closing of the applications that I'm, this is, the next week we would, you know, go through and, and essentially get the committee involved and then they're laid out from a standpoint of selected and then build, like, probably the first week in March would be our first meeting. Okay, and um, do we have a plan as far as when it's going to go out to the community? Would it be on Monday? Tomorrow, it will go out tomorrow morning. Yeah, we would By email? Yeah, via okay. email and press release um, out. So, okay. um, in fact, I will share, it'll probably be tomorrow, not tonight, because we'll be driving the roads to get safe. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that, um, that we'll send it out to you guys, the link to you. So if you know people specifically that are interested, Feel free to forward that link. Um, and, and can you um, define community for us? Because I know we've had participation in, in topics from surrounding communities. Can you define is this going out to families with Saline area schools, kids, people that pay taxes? Like, define. Who yeah, they, going in to? general, they would be defined as, as residents or uh, families within the Saline area school district. Okay. So it could be a, you know, it could be someone whose students go here they might live outside. But if their student goes here or they live in the community, does not take, they don't need to have students currently in the system. So a uh, good deal of work ahead of us till we can get going, but uh, it's been uh, 
I don't think yeah. it's good work. It is, but you know, I think a lot of people in some here, you know, the, the amount of time, energy, and effort, and investment in us as, a, as you know, an administration and board to be able to articulate um, ideas and thoughts and, and, in thoughtful ways. This can be a very um, awkward and unnerving conversation to have at times um, around a variety of issues, and I think it's important for us to, to grow as individuals and grow as a community. And so, um, again, I appreciate the support we've gotten on this issue. Any other comments? No, you covered it so well. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, the budget committee update, Trustee Valenti. Yes, budget committee met uh, the first Monday of this month. We went over the budget amendment that was already presented here. We did a more of a deeper dive into the budget, looking at some things behind what you saw. Uh, we also uh, looked at the uh, bond update, which we've already talked about today. We looked at that the land sale, pending land sale, and the status of that. Uh, one of the other things that we're doing is, uh, Assistant Superintendent Mosley is sending out uh, for insurance to try to see if we can uh, put some bids out for that and see what, how our insurance costs stack up. Um, Health insurance? No, no property, property, property cash. Tax. Property cash. Okay. What else? Anything else? Um, we decided uh, it was a good opportunity with the, the transition between Janice and Miranda to kind of drill down into specific mm -hmm. line items of the budget. So Tim and Dennis and I identified two areas that we wanted to go more deeply into with Miranda. Uh, next time, so we'll be looking at buildings and grounds, which is a $4.3 million mm -hmm. line item, and um, instructional innovation, which I think is a $1.2 million right. line item. Um, just to better understand everything that, that builds up to the overall budget. Steve was relaxed when I told him Rex panic, but I think <laughs> Steve was relaxed. Yeah. <laughs> so, I gotta come to the budget again. Rex, you just want to learn more about your budget. <laughs> all, right, all right, all right, Go to the source. All right, thank you. All right. Consent agenda. Can I have a recommended motion to authorize the following items as part of the consent agenda? A. Approval of the regular Board of Education meeting minutes of January 22nd, 2019. B. Approval of payment of the general fund accounts payable of February 12th, 2019 in the amount of $1,087,770.66. C. Approval of payment of the Series 1 bond fund accounts payable of February 12th, 2019 in the amount of $104,272.44. D, approval of payment of the Series 2 bond fund accounts payable of February 12, 2019 in the amount of $165,546.20. E, receive and file the contracts for the Assistant Superintendent of Curriculum, Assistant Superintendent of Finance, and Assistant Superintendent of Human Resources as submitted by Superintendent Graydon. F, receive and file the February Curriculum, Finance, and Human Resources reports. And G, approval of the early graduation requests as submitted by Superintendent Graydon. So moved. Support. All those in favor, please signify by aye. 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 Those opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries 6-0. Um, the next agenda, I have the school climate report. Is that good? Correct. School climate report, and um, I believe we'll be doing like quarterly. That's fine. Got more time to prepare. 